Each of those machines is queued up to the boundary study web page. And our boundary study web page looks very much like this. Um, just to point out, we have posted some recent emails that we've received. Um, so please be sure in your spare time to, uh, to check out our email inputs. Uh, some of that's from committee members, uh, some comments from the previous meeting. Um, and so we've posted them there for you. Um, all the materials from last week's meeting are posted under the meeting one here. Um, but what we'd really like to draw your attention to is the interactive mapping tool. Um, so if you could click on that on each of your uh, laptops. And the interactive mapping tool is a really nice interactive map. This will work with any, uh, this is compatible with almost any device, any mobile, uh, Android or um, Apple based device uh, should be able to handle this without any additional software. Um, up in the upper right hand corner here you can see base maps. This will give you the option of seeing a street view or a satellite view or a hybrid view of the both. So that will allow you to uh, control that. Um, if you enter in a specific address, it will zoom to a specific address. Um, also, you're, you have zoom tools here as well with a plus and minus. The home tool will take you back to uh, a default extent. Um, over to the left, uh, if you open up the uh, choose map layers to view, we'll give you some different options in terms of the layers that you're viewing. We can view our planning blocks uh, with the option of seeing the ID numbers or the K5 live at 10 counts. And these, uh, these are touch screen capable, so you can use your fingers to, uh, to zoom in as well, uh, to zoom in and zoom out on those screens. Um, also available are the walk zones, to turn those on and off. The uh, middle school and high school zones, or the current elementary school zones. And then you'll see the options we'll be discussing tonight, options one, two, and three. And as we go through the process and more options become available, those will be available layers as well. Uh, down below you can see the legend if you have any questions about the, uh, what the symbols or the colorizations mean. And there's print options at home also if, in case you're hooked up to a printer. So if you have any, pro if you, any problems with those tonight or navigating that, please just raise your hand and one of us will be around to, uh, to assist you. But I think this will give you some nice detail on, uh, on um, if you have any questions about some specific areas or streets or neighborhoods. Uh, just as a reminder, we're getting started. Uh, as a reminder, our, um, in case we have to exit in the case of an emergency, we can exit out the doors here to the side. We have restroom facilities right outside this door here. And uh, let's get started. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, let's see, let's get me back on this PowerPoint here. While you're doing that, I'm just, uh, um, Get, talk to the committee here for a second. Thank you all for coming back, and uh, it's good to see you all again um, for meeting two here. Um, everybody should have signed in when, sh when, you, when you got here and picked up some new materials to collate into your packet. You also got a little a separate a couple sheets on, the se on a separate uh, handout, and these are, these are intended to replace which, so a couple pages that you had in your meeting one. Uh, what these are is... Um, Vincent Farm, as we discussed, was, was, was really a kind of a two-part process in this, and they were involved in, the, in a study that was done earlier this year, and there um, were some nuances with how to estimate enrollment and, and factoring out um, how many students live in the boundary and live out, and so what we've done is we've made a couple of edits to these two sheets for the, li for the live in attend out data for Vincent Farms and also the, the planning block at the far south of Vincent Farms 
Just a couple of updates to make sure that we align perfectly with what was uh, presented or finalized at the end of the last process with Victory Villa. So uh, just one thing to, to note is if you could just replace these two pages um, with, what, with what you have in your packet just to make sure that you have the most recent and latest and greatest information. You also have a good deal of information in your packet for meeting two um, as a, for a follow-up, um, a lot of follow-up materials which I'm going to cover here shortly. So our goals tonight are just to review some new information and give you um, the, a couple of starting options, the draft baseline options. Uh, we've, we've drafted three options for starters for you to look at and react to tonight, which we'll get to here in a bit. Um, we're going to break into small working groups and have you guys work uh, like in your small groups like you did last time. But this time you're going to be actually looking at those options and marking those up and giving us your feedback as it relates to those options. Um, and then and have a discussion around that. So really tonight's main purpose is to talk about and, and give us some feedback on a couple of starting point options that we have. Before we get there though, I want to do a cup, another uh, overview on our objectives because these are really important and these are kind of the rules to follow when you look at uh, making a boundary adjustments. So um, the key objectives for you as a committee are to reduce overcrowding in the region, to create viable successful boundaries to utilize the added capacity um, at the new Northeast Area Elementary School and other, area, and other schools involved in this study, and to support diversity among the schools that reflects the, this area, the community, and the school system. Uh, participating schools, I think everybody who, uh, there are people from, uh, from every single school around the table here, and um, one thing to note with Oakley Elementary School, we're really focusing primarily on that satellite area and in determining if that should be uh, involved or not. Um, so we're not looking really comprehensively at the entire Oakley boundary, more the satellite area. And these are the considerations in the, per Rule 1280, and these are really the rules to follow. So if you start looking at the options, you start sizing them up one next to the other, you should always go back and say which one better adheres to these considerations as a whole. And these are maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the school system and the region, uh, the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, minimizing the number of times any individual students are reassigned, efficient use of capacity in affected schools, long-term enrollment and capacity trends in future capital plans, location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns, and phasing in boundary changes by grade level for high schools. And uh, the last one really doesn't affect us because we're really talking more, uh, focusing on elementary schools here. We're not making any adjustments to any other level. This is really elementary school adjustments, not middle or high school adjustments that you are considering. Additional things to think about when you, st when you start looking at this is using geographic features such as uh, roads, railroads, creeks, major highways, things like that. Looking at boundaries crossing over, things, uh, features like that and try to eliminate existing satellite boundaries such as that Oakley area which I talked about at the last meeting. Some important reminders about the, about the process uh, related to this process is that uh, I mentioned this before but a boundary change study was conducted for Victory Villa uh, earlier this year. Uh, revised boundaries for these schools were approved by the board in June of 2017 so you're working with the new newly revised uh, Victory um, Vincent Farm boundary uh, specifically. So Vincent Farm was included in both boundary change studies and the southern border was changed as a result of the Victory Villa boundaries change study. And this, this change is incorporated into the map options for the northeast area. So, um, and, and this is what I was talking about. We made some adjustments to make sure that everything aligns and that we're accurately estimating the number of students that are in Vin, uh, Vincent Farm as a result of that and um, giving you a good depiction of Vincent Farm as it sits with that, with this adjustment uh, that happened earlier this year. One thing to note is that the projection data that you have has not been revised yet. Uh, so the projection information for Vincent Farm still reflects the pre-boundary uh, study uh, for Vincent Farm. So that's something that will be forthcoming and we'll provide to you uh, when we have it available. So um, materials that are in your handouts as, re as uh, per some requests from the committee members is that uh, we have revised maps with planned approved residential development and the number of units. 
So you have a, a development map, and then we also have provided you the, the, the development names and the number of units within each development um, in, in, a, in, a, in a packet, in a sheet in your packet. So that was something that you had requested. Again, projections and utilization are based on the 2016 official enrollment. It doesn't include the impacts of uh, Victory Villa for Vincent Farms. So that is something, but you do have some projection and utilization data. Uh, you had asked for a Northeast L Area Elementary map, one of those uh, individual letter size maps of the focus centered on the Northeast, the new Northeast Area School, and that is included in your packet as well. Um, in your packet, you have a list of relocatable classrooms, and then some, uh, some dialogue and explanation on how the state rated capacity is calculated. And uh, you know, this is still, uh, everything's a work in progress. We, we always help anything that you need, you feel that's important. We can always supplement your packets with more information if, uh, if, you, if you think it's something that we have not included that's important for you. Another question that you had at the last meeting was do enrollment projections factor in approved residential development? Um, and the, the answer is the potential student yield from approved residential development is factored into these enrollment projections. So when you look at those, that list of approved developments and the number of units and things, everything that's in the pipeline that's, that we're looking at, that we've shared with you, that is, has been factored into these projections uh, when you look at those for, for the schools. And that's in, th those would be included in that packet that shows the, the list of developments. And there's some more detailed information on the student yield factors at the strategic planning website. So uh, you can always reference that link if you wanna look further which copies of the PowerPoint have been provided to you. Another question that you had in some of your like, uh, the little sheets that you had given us that we took back home with us, were how are the apartment condo buildings count, counted in planning blocks? And <clears throat> when we map the student data, we map out every single student based on their home address. Regardless of whether they live in a single family house or an apartment or a condo, those students are placed on the map. And then they are counted and, and, to and totaled up to make those planning block totals. So every, any, student, any student that attends Baltimore County Public Schools is, is, is reflected in, in your packet in terms of those planning block numbers, regardless of the type of home and things like that that they live in. So apartments and things like that, you may have 100 students attending one apartment that has the same address, say 100 Main Street, but then they have apartment one through 100. Those students would all be uh, geocoded and mapped out so that we have uh, 100 students counted in a particular apartment, if that's the case. Um, hold on a second. Let's get a, uh, let me get a microphone for you so that we can um, answer so that you can, we can, uh, everybody can hear you. Right here on the end. Yes. I just wanted to know how are um, some homeless students, how are they counted? Chris, would you like to answer that? Um, students are would would still be counted within their. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't have the. We can certainly get you some of the technical details, but even even homeless students are indeed counted where they're um, based on the school. They're included in the school counts of the schools that they attend. Yes, when we estimate enrollment, we start with the we start with the enrollment of the building, and we only when we, when you make an adjustment or an option, we're only moving students that live in the in the planning block that attend um, their zoned school. So so the so that's how we estimate enrollment to pick up, make sure we account for students that may attend a school that don't live in the in the area or or more transient in, in nature and things like that. Another question were, uh, are there additional capital projects proposed to relieve overcrowding in this region? I know that there was a lot of comments about the, the, the utilization of this area is still over 100% even with the new school. And that's something that, um, that, that's, a, that's a good observation and, and you, are, you are correct. Um, the schools for our future uh, 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 initiative includes four elementary school projects in this region to provide capacity relief. Victory Villa Elementary uh, is, is one of them, and that has been, um, the boundary study has been completed for that. The Northeast Area Elementary School 1, which is the, uh, the one that we are focusing on right now, is uh, as part of this. There's another Northeast Area Elementary School uh, that is um, still pending state approval and dates to be determined. That, that is actually down uh, on Ridge, uh, looking at 
a property down um, south of the study area, somewhere around Ridge Road. I think that the district owns some property down there. So there is some, uh, some expectations that, that that's going to help provide some further relief to the study area, particularly schools that are right on the southern part of your study area um, that, are, that are on the southern part of this, of this region. And then there's Red House Run Elementary School is getting an addition, which is uh, pending state approval and the dates to be determined as well. And pending the um, um, Maryland State Department of Education site plan approval, uh, BCPS has proposed a BOE owned site for the location of the second northeast area located at the intersection of Ridge Road and Gum Spring Road. And that's the one here, this northeast area, this one right here that I was uh, referring to um, just a second ago. So that's expected to give us um, some additional relief and provides further relief to this, to this region as a whole. Another question was, is there a utilization target for the schools? Um, and BCPS doesn't typically set utilization targets for boundary studies, but the committee may consider an average, uh, uh, the study area average as a, what I call a soft target utilization. And in this area with the new school capacity, that utilization number is 102%. So really, when, what, what, I, what I typically do as a starting point is I look and see how, try, try to get the schools close to that as a, as a, as a starting point, and then you kind of make adjustments based on schools that are expected to have uh, more growth or less growth. And so, you know, you start off with 102 maybe as, a, as an initial target, but then make adjustments based on the other considerations and things that you have to focus on, uh, such as enrollment projections and plan developments and then future capital projects uh, and things like that that are close to the study area. Another question is, what is the most current and detailed enrollment data available? Um, and you are working with 2016-17 as we discussed. This process does span over two school years. Um, the enrollment data for 2017 will still be in flux until the first week in October. Um, it cannot be, uh, once we get that data, we actually have to take that data and map it all out so that we can make sure that all the students are placed on the map and then put, put all this information together. So, it, um, so, it's, uh, so we don't have that information available at this time, but once that data and information is ready and the district's ready to uh, provide it and, and, we, and we get it mapped out, we will incorporate it into this process and, to, 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 and look at getting you some updated information as you have requested. So um, just stay tuned for that. That's still a work in progress. And when it is available, we will work to, to give you updated information. Uh, another other question is, what is the history of the Oakley satellite? Um, the Oakley satellite was established uh, way back in September 1st of 1979 to specify that all students in the Double Rock Town homes, uh, which are now the Dunfield Town homes, shall attend Oakley Elementary School. <coughs> At the time, it was a practice that if a new development was expected to overcrowd the districted school, the development was redistricted to a nearby school with available capacity, and that created satellite, er uh, satellite areas. And uh, you see residuals of this all over Baltimore County, and I, I deal with these all over uh, across the United States. It's something that, that was a pra common practice back in the 70s, but it's something that people in school districts are really trying to get away from and trying to get kids back to closer to their school, which is why it's one of our one of the, the focal points of one of the things for you all to consider as a committee. Another question was, under what conditions may students choose to stay in their school once a boundary goes into effect? And the district has, uh, Baltimore County Public Schools has a, a, a clearly defined uh, special permission transfer policy. And um, special permission transfers will be approved during the first year of a boundary change for students currently enrolled in grades fourth and fifth 7th, 8th, or 11th and 12th. So it's really this 4th and 5th is what we're looking at um, of the school affected by a change in attendance area. And students express their wish to remain in the school through their terminal grade. So those final two years, if a student's in the 4th and 5th grade, um, during, uh, uh, at that time, those students are eligible for special permission transfer. If a student uh, who meets the criteria has a sibling currently enrolled in the affected school, the sibling will be given the option of remaining in the affected school through his or her terminal grade as well. And um, there are more details about special permission transfers that you can find in policy in Rule 5140 um, on the school district webpage. 
Uh, another question was, what is state-rated capacity and how is it determined? Um, state-rated, the capacity of the schools in this district are just like any other district in the state of Maryland, and they're defined by the State Department of Education. Uh, they're calculated based on the number of teaching stations in the school and how they are used. Um, it applies to the permanent building only and does not include uh, modulars or uh, portable uh, uh, spaces like the uh, trailers and things like that. Um, there are room size and use standards for what may or may not count towards the state rated capacity. And there is a packet in your handout that gives a little more detail on state rated capacity. But I think the big takeaway is that p portables and, uh, and, and, and modular units are not included. And um, it's the same method that's used for all schools in this entire district and state. What is this anticipated state rated capacity for the new school? This new elementary school is being constructed to accommodate 725 students, but um, there's an opportunity to place much needed special education programs in the area, which uh, reduces the available capacity uh, to 705 for, for students uh, based on the K-5 counts and what, we're, what you're working on as a committee. That allows space at the school to accommodate special programs um, and, and, things and things like that. So 705 is really the target number for, um, for you as a committee when we're working with, uh, when we're working with options. Another update is the Office of Transportation is currently evaluating walk boundaries for the new elementary school and Seven Oaks Elementary. Um, this information will be provided as soon as it becomes available. So they're looking, evaluating the, the walk areas for those schools and um, whenever that information is available, we will uh, give you updates um, as soon as it becomes available. This is the, the correction that I mentioned in that packet, that little sheet uh, that I was talking about. Before it had 150 students for Vincent Farm out of the study area. Now it more accurately reflects the 13, 13 students because this 150 included students in the area that were zoned out of Vincent Farm at the last time. So we made some adjustments just to give you more of an accurate depiction of what's, what Vincent Farm looks like right now. And, um, and that's included um, so the corrected version is in one of those sheets. And then there's that live attend matrix that I talked about last time is also uh, aligns with the revised version of the Vincent Farm data. There's the interactive map that uh, Mr. Bricado mentioned and talked about and I'll be walking around when you get into it. I can help orient you with the interactive map um, and things like that. It's something that you can use in as a resource in addition to the hard copy maps those help you zoom in and the further you go, the more detail you get and things like that. So uh, the, the small planning block review, you guys met in small groups at the last meeting um, and you evaluated planning blocks. Um, there um, were some questions and, and comments about planning blocks. Um, there are some blocks with zero population and those are, those <clears throat> are blocks with no students living in them. A lot of times you'll have an industrial area and sometimes we'll carve it out into its own block so that you can kind of use it as connectors to connect areas together as you look at alternatives and trying to build options. And so that's why you see some of that. Um, there were some comments provi provided to suggest combining planning blocks 9 and 11 and I looked at those in detail. And, but after looking at those, those two planning blocks, um, usually we'll combine a block if a planning block splits a neighborhood that's connected by the same road and it's like splitting a subdivision. Those two uh, planning blocks had two distinct separate subdivisions that did not connect to each other and they, access, they were accessed uh, off of a different, uh, di different access onto the main road. So I kept them separate, not to say that they can't stay together in options and things like that, but I kept them separate just so that you can still have as much uh, the option to, for, to look at variable, variables and different options. So planning blocks have not been modified since meeting one. A lot of your comments and things were looking at potential scenarios and things like that, which are certainly good. Um, but we did not make any adjustments to the planning blocks uh, as, uh, as of now, uh, but there's still potential to make edits as you guys look at options. Sometimes when you start looking at the options, that's when you start to think, okay, well, um, maybe this would be better to split this planning block to create a better option. And that's, that's something that, that can, that's certainly possible. And you had made some notes about some of the planning blocks and uh, areas and potential options and looking at concepts. 
and some of those have been incorporated into some of the options that you have that we have drafted for you today. But you know, we're, we're interested in getting your feedback and, um, and getting your uh, first gut reaction to some of these. You also did the Strengths, Limitations, Opportunities uh, uh, Challenge. Um, and uh, this is some of the results of that. We have the full comprehensive summary of those in your, sh in your sheet. But some of the strengths in the, pr in the present state, uh, some of the strengths or boundaries uh, follow major roads and are logical, the current boundaries. Uh, you have strong communities and schools in this entire area. Uh, transportation is efficient in this area and the short bus commutes because you know the way that the roads are, are laid out. Some of the limitations in this area is that your schools are overcrowded. I think the data does certainly represent that. Um, and there are some transportation issues on the major roads and congestion and things like that. I think that I and, uh, and Andrew have certainly experienced that as we've driven around. And as you all live here, you certainly can, can see that as well. And then the distribution of the population is a limitation in density. Some areas are very densely populated and some areas may not be. But, and as you look at those planning block numbers, you can see that they, the numbers really vary from area to area in terms of number of students that are in, in those. Some of the opportunities are to maintain and improve the diversity in the area, uh, to relieve overcrowding with the new school and making adjustments to the boundaries and to eliminate that satellite at Oakley. That's, a, that's an opportunity that you have at your fingertips to, 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 to work on. The challenges you've identified were distribution of population density. Um, again, building sense of community at the new school and uh, that's a challenge in trying to establish a new community and, uh, and pride for the new school since, it, since it's brand new. And then continued growth of the area, something that's certainly is a challenge as you're working with data that we know of now and future data and but uh, you know it, as you work through this you're going to realize that you know these schools are 102 percent and uh, overall but you have to account for future growth as well and so it's, it's really not an easy task that you are that you're faced with so we've provided uh, some data in, in your packets to tonight that gives you some more information on capacity you have the state rated capacity of each school and you can see the, new, the Northeast Area Elementary is stated at 705, like we discussed. We've also provided information that shows you the current school utilization. So you can see you have the school names, the grade configuration that's in the school, the capacity. <clears throat> We've given you the pre-K through five enrollment at each school. Um, and this is the total head count. And then there's the FTE pre-K through five. And FTE is really the difference between headcount and FTE is that you take your preschoolers and they divide them by, by two because they have AM and pre PM classes and things like that. So it, it, uh, it kind of gives you a more realistic of, uh, look of how the building is used. Then we look at utilization. So you can see how the percent full of the buildings utilized. You can see it's 116% before adding on the new school. The number of students that live in each zone and go to their and and um, and go to their zone school um, are, are are listed here. The number of students that live out of the out of the school zone currently that but attend in are listed here. Um, and so when we estimate enrollment, we 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 add these students back into your enrollment totals for each school so that we can so we don't compromise programs and things that are offered at schools and students attending from out of zone for special reason, we, we, we count those back in so that we can account for um, the, the, those special programs and nuances of students coming in from out of zone. We give you a little a look of the over under capacity, how many seats over, how many seats under, and there are no, no schools that are under capacity in this, in this entire area. And then the total, uh, total head count for pre-K enrollment and then the FTE pre-K enrollment. And then you can see it's, it's half of the head count. So we add this FTE back into the totals as well when, when you start looking at option uh, estimates that we factor in. And again, victory, the Victory Villa process that uh, the impacts on Vincent Farm have been inc incorporated into this for a starting point. You'll get more comfortable with looking at these as you start, as we start looking at more options and things like that and going through the process. 
So uh, remember that these options are all draft. These are just starting points for you to look at and to consider. And the, the focus isn't on picking the best one at this point, but just to create, how, just look at how many options can you create. Think them out of the box. How many different scenarios could you create that accomplish your objectives and uh, um, adhere to the considerations? Not trying to pick the best plan yet, but just try to see how many different iterations could you create. And we'll be narrowing later. We've provided three options for you. Those are, those are included on the interactive map now. And you also have eight and a half by 11 maps in your packet for tonight. And then we also have plot maps of the options that are on each, at each group's table, as well as maps posted on the walls for the observers. So I always say, we know it's a kind of a daunting task with all this data. I usually say to study the, study the maps and then look at the numbers. Uh, you know, look at or focus on the numbers and say, okay, these this option has schools pretty uh, balanced, but this school is kind of higher on the utilization. Why is that? Now let me look at the map and see. Look at that school and see. Is there any way that we can make an edit and this and that? So look at the tables and then look at the maps to try to um, to try to kind of align them together and see how how things how can you make improvements to bring you closer to the objectives and considerations. Your options tables come in, come in this format, so you have your current FTE enrollment and then the option enrollment. So you can see uh, for each school how they may be impacted in, in terms of just total numbers. <coughs> We've given you some data also, the same, the same data but looking at it from a little bit differently in terms of utilization. So instead of enrollment numbers, this shows you the percent utilization for each school. So you've got currently, and then in, in each option, what is the utilization? And you'll notice it's 102% because we're now we have the Northeast Area School in play in here. And you can see in the options that there are not, not many schools are below 100. In a couple of cases, they are. Uh, you'll see that the Vincent Farms on the lower side in a couple of options um, to try to, to be more proactive because they have some of the, the greatest growth potential in, uh, in the area. We provide a percent minority data, so you can see what the cur current percent minority is for schools, and then what the option percent minority is, as well as free and reduced lunch percentage. And sometimes you'll, this is referred to as farms, free and reduced meals, but uh, free and reduced lunch, so you can see what the current free and reduced lunch percentage is for schools, and how the options vary. And then they'll also look at the uh, total. This shows you the study area percent free and reduced lunch from all schools combined, as well as the percent minority um, as a, from a study area total perspective. We provided you live-in uh, impact data, so you could see how many um, students would be impacted in any particular option. So we're, we're the, each option as it sits now is impacting over 1,000 students in the study area, which makes somewhat makes sense because you're building a new school and the entire school population is included in, in this impact count. When you look at this, this is a really a detailed table that summarizes up to this. So everything that's green shows students who weren't moved, but everything in tan shows students who were moved. So, and this is for example, option one, Kearney sends 114 students to Seven Oaks. Chapel Hill sends 246 to the new Northeast Area Elementary. Gunpowder 160 to the Northeast Area. Um, and Perry Hall sends students to a couple of different schools in this scenario, but they, were, they keep 484. There could be a situation, though, where students are moved uh, a couple of different ways to try to balance out utilization. Students may not always go directly to the new school. In order to balance utilization, you may see some students moving from one already established school to another established school to try to balance utilization. So it's not as simple as just trying to fill up the new school and not affect any other school because you have to try to equalize that utilization and make, make sure things are equitable. We've given you feeder pattern data so you could see the percent of, of schools uh, that are split between two middle schools. So for instance, Kearney Elementary is split to two middle schools. 28% of the elementary schools splits to Perry Hall, 72% goes to Pine Grove, and this gives you the totals. Schools that show 100% represents an elementary school that feeds 100% into a middle school. So we have for the current data, for the current boundaries, and then for each option, we've provided this as well. 
So just a little overview on the options. Uh, uh, I put this together because it helps out, uh, it has helped committees in the past, but it just kind of gives you a little bit of a, a glimpse on the advantages and limitations of each option. And um, this doesn't necessarily mean that, that there aren't other ones that you may identify, but these are some of the things that I have, I have identified. So for option one, you can see that in every map, the new, the new Northeast Area Elementary has a pink zone, and it comes here and it kind of wraps around the, 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 the walking area of Perry Hall here. Um, but some of the advantages of option one is that it eliminates the Oakley Elementary satellite, so that satellite gets picked up into Kearney in this particular option. Um, there is capacity relief prov provided to all schools in the study area, they, so they do get relief, although they're not fully relieved, they still get relief. Uh, it impacts the second fewest number of students among all options, and there are three, so it's number two out of three for what it's worth. Um, minority percentage is relatively balanced with the exception of Kingsville Elementary School, and Kingsville is tough because Kingsville is kind of a, a rural northern school and it's, it's sparsely populated. Um, and it's, and it's not, it doesn't have a, a, a lot of, uh, a high percentage of minority in, in areas around Kingsville. It's already over capacity or right at over capacity. So Kingsville is a tough one. And you're, you're going to see that in, in certain areas when you work on it. You, you're looking at balancing all of the objectives. And so that's, that's not surprising to me that, that this one is on the low side, um, given, the, given just the, the, the nature of the community and how the, how the, the, the schools are distributed. The farms for the North, Northeast Area Elementary School is closest to the area average, so the Northeast Area a Elementary School is a good representation of the, the study area. Um, Oakley splits to one fewer middle school, so Oakley currently splits to four different middle schools, which is a high number. Um, and in this, in this particular scenario, getting rid of that sa satellite area, Oakley splits to one fewer middle school, which I, I, I have identified as a positive. The Northeast Area Elementary School, in terms of limitations in this map, that this has the highest utilization. This has, represents 105% utilization for the new school. So, you know, it's on the high side, but it's still only 3% higher than the, the study area average. And um, the boundary for the Northeast, Northeast Area Elementary School does cover a large geographic area. So it spreads all the way from Kingsville all the way down into Joppa View territory and things like that. So it does spread a long way. Option two has a little bit different of a configuration. Like if I toggle back to option one, look at Seven Oaks here in gunpowder. So you see Kearney, Seven Oaks is more, um, looks like this, it picks up more of Kearney and less of gunpowder. In option two, gunpowder comes a little bit more over into the Seven Oaks area. And the northeast area stretches a little more fur further east, and Chapel Hill goes further east to give Vincent Farm more relief. Some of the advantages that still uh, eliminates the Oakley Elementary satellite uh, and absorbs into Kearney, which is closest to the closest to that area. Uh, capacity of the relief is provided to all schools in the study area, except for Kearney and Seven Oaks. So they are a little bit still on, uh, you know, a little bit on the high side. When you look at the utilization numbers, you can you can concur. Um, there is lower utilization for Vincent Farms, and that's really to looking more proactively to try to accommodate some future growth. I think there's a couple. Of, couple hundred more students expected to come into Vincent Farms from future development and it's more probably the, going to be impacted the most in this region by new by future planned developments. Uh, the minority percentage is relatively balanced since, with the exception of Kingsville like I mentioned in one. The farms percentage for several schools are brought closer to the average um, and again Oakley Elementary School splits to one fewer middle school. Some of the limitations of this particular option, the greatest number of students are impacted among all three options. I think it's around 1,500 or so. And then Kearney and Seven Oaks, utilization increases to 105, 105%. So they're, you know, they're going up a little bit when um, the utilization is 102. So we're trying to relieve capacity, but some of them go a little bit up. So it's something to consider and, and uh, as a factor. Option three has a little bit different of a conf configuration. You can see it's more sort of squared off for the Northeast Area Elementary School. It picks up the area that used to cross over, gunpowder used to cross over primarily, and it provides a lot of relief to Chapel Hill here. Um, and this area for Kearney and um, Seven Oaks and such looks a little bit different. Um, some advantages of this is that capacity relief is provided to schools in the study area. The minority percentage is relatively balanced 
with the exception of Kingsville and Oakley. Oakley stays high because that satellite area wasn't removed here. We, we did just created a scenario for you to see what it would look like if we did not remove the enclave at Oakley. And that's what this particular scenario just gives you a look of what, of what that would or could look like if, if we didn't get rid of that satellite area for Oakley that still exists. The minority percentage for the Northeast area is close to the area average and uh, farms uh, data are brought closer to the average. And this impacts the least amount of students among all three options. Some limitations, like I said, the Oakley satellite is still here. So that's something to, to consider. And Oakley still splits to four middle schools, which is something that's on the, really on the high side from what we see across the country, something that, that, that does impact um, those kids. And then the boundary for the Northeast Area Elementary School covers a large geographic area as well in this scenario. So uh, Ms. Bell wasn't able to be here tonight, but I'm just going to re retouch on a couple of things here and that when we talk about effective cl collaboration. Um, just allow, when, when you're working as in small groups, and I think you guys are doing a great job, I can see the dynamic is good and you're working in your groups, but just make sure to be inclusive and, talk and, and work as a team. And, um, and allow each group member to, to, to talk and don't dominate, have, let one person dominate the discussion and things. Um, and be mindful of the guidelines as you work through, this, through a collaborative process. And you start talking about, um, you know, use more um, uh, I statements. If there's a conflict between you and another committee member, talk about, you know, it's more like, well, I think it's this and not, not we or, um, you know, um, so just use, use I statements and things like that. It's definitely the, the best way to avoid a conflict. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Doctor here, and he's going to give you a little bit of orientation on the small groups, and um, and then we'll let you guys get to work. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to had to steal a microphone from Mr. Bercato. I didn't have the nice lapel mic like Matthew does. Um, my name is Andrew Doctor. I'm a planning analyst with Cropper GIS Consulting, um, and this is my first time ever getting up in front of a committee, so go easy on me. Um, I'm just here to introduce this small group exercise that we're going to go through. We're going to break into six groups. Well, we're already broken into six groups, so we've got the first one done out of the way. That's good. I got to laugh. That works. Good enough for me. Um, each group, everyone, together, we're going to have 45 minutes. We're going to take that 45 minutes to look at the three options that we have. We should have plot maps out there, I believe, those big maps. Um, should have those to look at. What we're going to do in this next 45 minutes is we're going to take um, the markers and the post-it notes that everyone has on, those t on the tables with them, and I encourage you, please, write on those maps. You can make notes. I like this part. This part looks really good. Or, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, so any areas you want to address, both good and bad, we want to take those notes. So we want to take the next 45 minutes and review all of the maps and write down um, anything that we feel needs to be addressed. Um, we are going to look at all three options in this 45 minutes, so I'd suggest probably try to give each option an equal shake and give each option about 15 minutes so that we can use that 45 minutes excellently. Um, I have the time as, holy cow, it's 6.45 on the dot by my watch, so. Yeah. This will work perfectly. We'll be back at about 7.30. We'll be walking around, answer any questions that everyone may have, um, and we can get going on this. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So you'll have, you'll have about, uh, we'll regroup after this so that you can have discussion and everybody can benefit from your feedback. I just had one. Yes, we had a question here. I just yes, have sir. one quick question. Sure. Is there, do you know of any proposed relief in the plans for the Oakley area? Well, Such that if we didn't, re I'm not saying we're going to do it, but if we didn't remove the satellite, is there some plan in place do you know of where there's any other, anything that's going to help relief that if we didn't do it here? Yes, the Oakley area is in the southern part of the study area, which is close to that, that uh, Ridge Road area that we talked about with that, that future planned uh, capital improvement project. Okay. So that does have potential to get further relief when that comes online, but that's, you know, we're looking a couple of years out on that sure still. but there's nothing in the central area you know, that's actually in the central area there's nothing in the central area we know of that's going to be in, in the, uh, in the I works. Think the closest one is that one that we'd identified the ridge the ridge okay. road area that's the closest one okay. to it, from my understanding right, thank you yes sir
I'm just going to set your time out here. Here, so this doesn't accidentally shut off on you. You can also swap really quickly on the layer.
So it's a 7.12 right now. Let's say maybe uh, another 10 or 15 minutes if you can. Um, and uh, just, you know, do your best to evaluate the pros and cons, what you like and don't like about the maps, and take notes so we can take this all back and look at it. We'll give you about 10 or 15 more minutes, and then we'll group as a, uh, together and discuss your findings.
as you guys uh, start to wrap up, if you have any unanswered questions and things like that, make sure you write those down um, so that we can follow up with you. Have any other an unanswered questions and things like that as well? Okay, why don't we, uh, why don't we regroup and um, share out some of your thoughts. What would be good if we could um, with each group when they want to report so that we can all benefit? I think it's, it's last time we were, you were reporting at your tables, but sometimes I think other groups, including myself, had a hard time seeing what you had. Maybe if each group could come up here and you could have a couple of group members hold the maps up and then one person sort of talk to the map so that we can uh, so that we can all look at at your comments and your feedback and things like that um, and then and then when you're done you can go back to your table and the next group could come up um, who wants to start first anybody want to volunteer to go first okay well they they spoke up first so okay you're second that's that's fine yeah if you could come up front so then and then you bring your maps up or any notes and share your comments Okay, so option one, uh, the pros we had for that was that the relief was relatively equal amongst all the schools. Um, Gunpowder in Northeast area had a, little, had a little more kids, but generally equal amongst the schools. Uh, and that we also got rid of the satellite. Uh, the cons we had on this one was that Gunpowder still crosses over Route 1, 
which we had kind of a goal to try to use Route 1 as a dividing line and keep gunpowder on uh, all on one side of uh, Blair Road. Um, so that gunpowder still crossed it. And um, uh, in this one, and really all of them in, in some regards, um, there's not enough, necessarily enough relief to certain schools that have more planned growth. Um, there's a lot of houses coming to uh, the Joppa View and Chapel Hill areas. Uh, so um, while there's some relief, there's still over capacity and there's more kids to come within the next year or two. So they'll be right back up to where they were in a lot of regards. Is that it? Did I hit everything? I don't want to misrepresent the group. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not going to go rogue. Uh, option two, again, the pro, the only real, <laughs> I think the only pro we had here was that the satellite is gone um, on this one. Uh, option two um, definitely gave a lot of relief to Vincent Farms. We felt maybe a little too much relief. Um, we know there's a lot of future building coming, but there is also a new school that's going to be coming to help alleviate some of that relief. That was just our, our thoughts looking at the numbers. Um, there was still a lot of high utilization at Perry Hall and Chapel Hill, uh, Kearney. Um, so a lot of schools still had a lot of, a lot of uh, overcapacity still. Um, we did have some moves, um, potentially moving some future development areas that might go to other areas. And then cons, then pros and cons. Yeah, okay. Yes, I did. Did I miss anything there? Good? Good. Okay. Option three, um, the option, the pro here was the most relief for the schools, which is the Northeast Area study, so giving relief to the Northeast Area schools should be a priority, we felt, some people felt. Um, the con was, of course, that it keeps the satellite there. Uh, we did have a question if any other relief could be done at a school in the Central District like Pine Grove or Hartford Hills to help alleviate that district and put it back into Kearney, maybe by having something from Kearney and going over to there. Um, option three, a pro of this also was it kept everything, gunpowder, everything on the uh, west side of Bel Air Road. Thank you very much. Okay, you guys uh, volunteered to be second, so you're up. So this is map one, obviously, and we said the positive of this was that we obviously got rid of the satellite, which we think should be happening on all of the maps. Um, most of the percentages were um, looked really good. And we did notice when they were saying about the size of the Northeast Area School that the um, travel was a little bit large. But when we took our little measurement from down here, we were noticing it's only about like a little less than three miles. So it wasn't too bad. I think it could be doable for the buses. So anything else added to one? Okay. Is this map two? So map two, we thought that um, most of the schools were over percentage. And I know when we were talking that we want to be at least close to 102%. And a lot of them, one, two, three, five of them were over 104%. So we thought most of them would be overcrowded already. This also a negative on this one was the greatest amount of students were moved through this um, map. And I guess a positive would be that the satellite is gone. Right, is that good? And we liked option three with a little bit of tweaking going on um, because we noticed that Seven Oaks was at 89%, which we thought was very low. So, um, and we obviously didn't like it because the satellite was still there, so we thought that if we could only move the satellite into Kearney um, and then move a little bit into Seven Oaks, then that would alleviate um, the 89% and make it 102. It does make Seven Oaks up to 100 or 105, but maybe they can help us with planning blocks. Um, and so that's what we thought would happen. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> you guys want to go next to this group over here at this table?
So option one, um, I think someone already said, we were a little concerned that the, the new area is a little bit too spread out as far as buses and travel. Um, going back to major roadways, it comes across Silver Spring and looks like it divides some of the communities which we were kind of concerned about. Um, it doesn't uh, take into effect that again, you're crossing a major roadway still for gunpowder where some of the options don't do that. So that's kind of what we were looking at for that. We like that it absorbs a satellite. I think someone said it. I think every option needs to show that because um, that's, I think, a, a really big priority. Um, option two um, displaces the most students, obviously. Um, we had a question with this as far as middle school feeder schools. Um, right now, a lot of the schools, Gunpowder, Seven Oaks, not Seven Oaks, but um, gunpowder and I forget what other ones, but they all go 100% to Perry Hall as well as some of the other ones. When you do this, it really switches that up. So how does that affect the middle schools? Um, and can you change the middle school when you do this? That was kind of a question that we had. Um, this still keeps Perry Hall at 111%, which is not good, <laughs> needs a lot of help. And Vincent Farm is only at 81. We know there's a lot of new growth and development that's gonna happen in Vincent Farm, but do they need to be that far under is, is a question. <laughs> um, option three, I think we liked, I don't remember, but of course the satellite is still an issue. Um, and again, crosses over some, some major roads there, but um, we thought going off of this one maybe with a little bit of tweaking, um, Perry Hall is still a concern. We, we really don't have a solution. We just have a concern that Perry Hall goes um, across Bel Air Road. Um, and we have a representative, representative from Perry Hall who says that a lot of these students' um, buses were an issue. I think that's what you were saying as far as? Transportation. Parent transportation is an issue, not buses. We have plenty of buses that go down there. But the parents don't have a mode of transportation. They don't have cars. There's a lot of rentals um, and a lot of apartments. So, you know, walkability and that kind of thing is not possible for them. So we're not really sure how to alleviate that because there's a heavy, you know, all the schools are on this side and not um, over here. So that, that's a challenge that we're seeing. We're not sure how to solve it, but that was something that definitely came up in our discussion. Okay, thank you very much. You guys want to go next? Just move, moving around the, going uh, clockwise around the tables. Um, the first thing that we disliked on the option one is the layout on the Perry Hall school, um, the new school. It's just such a wide split, and we felt like down here, although geographically it doesn't look like a big commute, that's going to be a long bus ride with the congestion in the area. Um, so we felt it was just a little too far. We also had a concern over here, one of the Vincent Farm area communities, um, truly these t blocks 9, 11, and 12 are a community here that in option one, two of the blocks go to Chapel Hill and one stays at Vincent Farm. And that seven uh, corridor there is really the, the major use area for there and all of the kids play sports together in that area in Kingsville. So we were a little concerned about those blocks splitting a community there. In option two, um, we have a little problem with the new school the planning block 138, there's a small U-shaped road in there uh, that really belongs with a community that is in the yellow here. So that planning block, we would like to see a possibility of that splitting into two areas with inside that planning block to keep the one community truly together. Um, we felt that this one had a much better sense of community for the Perry Hall in the dark purple there. and. Um, this one allows for future building in Vincent Farm, and we realize that that puts Vincent Farm way over and puts Perry Hall at 11%. But in every one of these scenarios, um, in the first one, gunpowder's at 108, and in the third one, job abuse at 110. So every one of these 
scenarios leaves one school that's pretty much higher than the rest. Um, the one thing that was good about this map too is the communities along seven, the seven corridor there, uh, were not divided. So we felt like this map, although the numbers aren't ideal, this is a better representation for the communities. And in scenario three, um, we're back to the same two problems with block 138 and um, and planning block 11 and 12 and 19 being separated over there. Um, we did not like the fact that the satellite community remains. We really feel that if we're doing all of this movement that we really want to take care of that satellite community. And we felt that um, there's a lot, again, this brings them through a very congested area, so this has this one area down here that we're just concerned about their bus time. Okay, and that planning block 138, do you have noted on there where you think it should split, or have you marked on the map where you think? Okay, great, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, would you guys like to go next? We didn't make nearly as many notes as other people, but um, so we, option one, we were looking at the new school and how it was kind of making a really big boundary um, for that new school. So this little community down here at the bottom we felt kind of shouldn't be put into the new school. Um, looking at option two, and again, um, like Ms. Allen said, that it shows the best with all the development that's happening at Vincent Farm, it will um, alleviate some of our numbers. And with the new building that's happening, the second new Northeast Elementary School leaving Joppa View and Vincent Farm higher numbers in the possible next redistricting could alleviate that. And then third option, as everybody said, the satellite community um, we feel should be put back. Um, so we didn't really like option three because of that. Okay, thank you. Um, and the last group. Yep. There it is, right there. Okay, so we, um, as a lot of us um, did tonight, we talked about. Um, option three, which still had that satellite, and we agree that someone had already said, if we're doing all this, then that is something we definitely need to take care of. And we looked at option two, and we just felt like um, things weren't as equitable as we were trying to make them be, and keeping communities um, together and a little, a little diverse. Um, option one, we took a look at, it does help to um, alleviate several areas. One is that um, Oakley will now uh, lose one middle school that they're feeding into. So there's a little bit more continuity there with keeping neighborhoods together and kids together as they transition from elementary to middle. And then we did notice that, you know, the, for the new area, it, wrap, it kind of wraps around um, the elementary and the middle school here, which kind of is a, a strange configuration. We're, we'd like to look a little bit more closer at um, those specific neighborhoods and maybe the diversity in those neighborhoods and how that is going to affect Perry Hall Elementary, just to, just to make sure. But we like this map. We felt like it was a little bit more equitable. And although it does put um, the new Northeast Area School at 105%, we were also wondering in other studies, what percentage of parents um, opted for the four or five special permission and sibling permission because that might eliminate that other 5%. So it's something that we were looking at. Yep. And that was it. Okay. Just finishing a note there. Okay. Okay. So if you have any, um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we capture all of your notes that you've made uh, on these maps and the post-its. So please leave them intact. And if you have any notes um, on the backs of pages and things like that, 
that you want to share. If you want to, if there's something that's a, a, a something in your report that you'd like to take, you can let me know. I'll take a quick picture of it just so I can document it. And you could still keep your your materials, or maybe I'll give you a copy out of my book and things like that. Um, and so just make sure that you keep any notes and documentation with at the table so that we can take this back because my plans are to take this information, spread them all out in the office and study all of your comments and feedback and try to see if I couldn't generate a couple more options based on, on your input. Um, but I I'm really impressed and really encouraged by the work that you've done. You, the, the small working groups are working very well and you guys are, are really uh, being productive here and giving us some really good, good feedback. Um, let's see. So we have a, uh, that's pretty much the end of what we've, of our objectives tonight. A couple of notes for housekeeping is that our next meeting is October the 4th, same place here from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, but we still have a little bit of time. Is there anybody else that wants to make any further comments or anything? I do know uh, one note that I have noted is that uh, I promise I'll do my best not to call it Vincent Farms anymore. It is Vincent, the school's called Vincent Farm. And I will make note, make sure that that's not replicated a hundred times in a PowerPoint presentation. But, um, and there were some questions about special permission transfers and at what rates uh, uh, people usually participate. So I'll talk with the district and see if maybe there's something that we can provide in terms of historically how many people usually uh, participate in the special permission, uh, those provisions and things like that. Um, but if you have any other questions, please keep them on the table on sheets of paper or even on the plots and we'll follow up with you. Is there any other questions or comments that anybody else wants to have before we adjourn? Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to say that I'm impressed with what you guys have taken from the meeting the last time and brought to the table this time. I know all, a lot of the questions and things that I wanted answered or wanted to see today we saw. So I just wanted to compliment you all. I can tell that it was uh, you looked into it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get you a mic. Yes, ma'am. Going back to the fourth and fifth grade option of continuing in your same school, I don't know if this really um, affects any decisions we make here, just more of a question that transportation for those students, would that be up to the parents or that thing? And I don't know how that would affect you know, what we're doing here, but just a general question. Uh, yes, Mr. Bricado, could you answer, is transportation provided for students who opt? Special permission transfer is it d does not include transportation. It would obviously it, it, it uh, it's it's dependent on whether the student lives within the walking boundary of the school or not. Um, but uh, transportation is not a component of uh, special permission transfer. Any other questions or comments before we let you all go home? Well, another good meeting, y'all. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you here on October the fourth, and uh, have a good night.